So this is uh, Cisco UCS and Cisco Intersight Programmability, uh, Automation and Orchestration Overview. I'm really going to be talking about programmability, right? Orchestrating that programmability. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. We have a demo over in the zone over here called um, a multi-domain demo. Not ACI multi-domain orchestrator, but just a multi-domain orchestrator using Cisco's auto, um, AO, Automation Orchestrator or Action Orchestrator, excuse me. Uh, so you can check that out and see how, like, you know, pull these tasks together. We have some UCS code in there, uh, creating service profile, creating an organization, et cetera. But mostly talking about programmability. Uh, actually, I'm John McDonough. I'm a DevNet developer advocate. I talk mostly about data center compute, programming data center compute, and orchestrating data center compute. That's UCS, Intersight, um, UCS Central, standalone Cisco SimC, Python, PowerShell, um, Curl, XML, whatever it is that fits your need, you know, I think that we could find a way to program it with UCS. These slides that I'm showing today are in this team room already. So if you want them, definitely join that team room at DevNet-1481. Slides are already there. If you want them, if you don't want them, that's okay too. If you haven't heard yet, DevNet has certifications coming out February 24th. There's the DevNet Associate Specialist Professional Experts of Future One. There is a DevNet Professional Certification for Data Center Automation. So I know that uh, half the questions are probably on uh, or a third of the questions are on um, UCS and Intersight programmability. And I know that because I wrote most of them. So if you're interested in certifications, the um, start, at De or start at Meet DevNet, I think, is right when you walk into the DevNet zone, they're talking about certifications like every couple of hours. They go through the whole process of the certification um, study groups that we have, courses, et cetera. So certifications, you want to know more, it's down at the front there. What I'm going to talk about today is what does programmability mean? The SDKs that we have currently, the tools that are in use or can be used or are coming. Like, so I put Terraform in here because I was going to talk about some Terraform with Intersight. And while there is a Git repository out on GitHub or a repo out on GitHub for Terraform for Intersight, I didn't really want to talk about it because it's not quite there yet. So I didn't want people going out and, and using it. So, but it is there. We are going to Terraform uh, for Intersight. So what does it mean, programmability, or what does that mean for UCS Manager and for, when I talk about UCS Manager, I'm really talking about Manager, Central, and the SimC. But what does programmability mean for UCS Manager, and what does it mean for Intersight? So UCS Manager uses HTTP as the transport to talk to the UCS manager, um, or to, for programmability to reach out to the UCS manager, it's over HTTP. But it's not REST. And I know you hear a lot about REST and um, APIs that are RESTful. UCS manager is just using HTTP as the transport. The encoding is XML. If the request works, you'll get back a 200 OK. If the request doesn't work, you'll get back a 200 OK. So you actually have to look at the response body to know if the request worked or if it didn't work. And we have methods, and the methods are in the XML. Config resolve DN, look up a distinguished name. Config resolve class, look up a class. Config conf MO, configure a managed object. Config conf MOs, configure multiple managed objects. Those are actually encoded into the XML that you're sending over in the HTTP. The authentication is a cookie or a token. You log in, you get back this token or a cookie. We call it a cookie in UCS. Some people call it a token. But it's the same thing. It's just this long string of characters, letters. And you have to send that with every request so the UCS manager knows what your rights are, what your capabilities are. Intersight, on the other hand, is a REST API. If you send something via REST API and you get back a 200 OK, it worked. Or it's in the process of working if you got a 201 or a 202, something like that. If you get back something other than that, your request didn't work. 
So it's actually intertwined with the HTTP protocol. And we use JSON encoding, and the methods are get, put. That's wrong. It's not post. It's pa I'm sorry. It's not put. It's patch. I'll fix it. It should be patch. You know, I knew something was going to bite me. I'll, I'll post the slides back out there. P-A-T-C-H. So our HTTP methods that we use are get. <laughs> it's patch. It's patch, it's patch. You know what? <laughs> I can't. Now I'm frozen. Here we go. Give me one second. All right. All right, like nothing happened. Thank you. It's patch, post and delete. And the authentication is with API keys. In the intersite interface, you generate an API key, and when you generate that key, you'll get the key, and you also get, well, you get a key pair. So you get the key that is in intersight, um, and you can access it at any time, but then you also get the secret key, and the secret key is copyable or downloadable at the time of creation. You've probably seen this with like Amazon and, and other systems where you get this key pair. Part is always available and the other part is only available at the time of key creation. Those API keys are used to sign requests that go to the InterSight uh, platform. And those requests are then decoded and if the keys, if the identifiers that were sent match the identifier that you have in the inside the InterSight system, well then your request can be processed. UCS Manager's been around for 10 plus years. As I said, it communicates those very HTTP, it's XML based, it supports transactions. Um, there's a bunch of things that come with it. There's the object model hier um, built in browser. It uses role based authentication. If you log into UCS Manager with your username and password and then you use that same username and password in your API, you have the same rights, every roles, capabilities, it just translates over. UCS Manager is highly available out of the box. When two Fabric interconnects are connected and they, um, one chassis, at least one chassis or one rack mount server is discovered, it is highly available. It also has the event stream. It's a flow of information, a flow of XML that comes out of the UCS Manager. That's how your client stays up to date. When you launch UCS Manager, the very first thing it does, if you were to look at the wire with uh, Wireshark, the very first thing it does is subscribe to the event stream. And that's how it knows when somebody on the other side of the country or the other side of the globe creates a service profile or an organization and it just pops up in your client because it's consuming the event stream. It's a management model based on, it's a hierarchical management model. Everything is an object in UCS Manager, and the objects belong to this hierarchy. Objects are of a class type. They inherit from the objects above it. Objects represent, uh, represent physical and logical entities. And objects are uniquely identified by a DN, a distinguished name. No other object in the entire object model has the same DN as any other object. They can be of the same class type, like compute, uh, compute blades are all of class type compute blade, but they all have different DNs. The DN, the distinguished name, is just built upon or built up by going up the hierarchy of the tree or going down the hierarchy of the tree, whichever way you call it, and appending the relative names together. So if the adapter or the interface, ETH2 interface on adapter one in blade two, in chassis five, is the only adapter that has this distinguished name. And that's how you build it, by concatenating the reference or the relative names together. 
So a very small portion of the object model. It's kind of broken up like this with the logical entity or the physical entities, but there will also be some logical things like statistics attached to physical entities, the fabric, and the organizations. Just, it's not exactly like this, but it is this sort of hierarchical model where the organizations are broken out from the fabric and are broken out from the, the physical entities. So what do we have in order for programmability tools that you can utilize to understand what that model looks like and what's in that model and what the objects in that model have available to them? Well, we have the object model documentation. And you can look at any object, see how it's contained, what it contains, what its attributes are, and what the properties are for those attributes. Like, for a name on a VLAN, you'd be able to find the regular expression that defines what a name for a VLAN could look like. These characters, one to 32 characters long. Or an ID, these ranges for an ID for a VLAN. All that's in the object model documentation. And I'm gonna show you in a second how to look at it, how to read it. We also have the object model browser. This comes with every UCS manager, every IMC, and every UCS central. You just go to the IP address of the system that you're on, slash visore.html, and you can look at the objects in the object model for that system. Their attributes and their attributes' actual values. Before I get to the, the demo of those things, well, you know what? Let me just show you those right now. I was going to say, let me talk about Intersight, but why mess it up, like change it up like that? So here's the object model, uh, or here's the object browser, Vasore. And if I put in Vasore uh, class name, like Compute Blade, and say I want to see all the Compute Blades, it'll bring back all the Compute Blade objects on my system, and I can see all the attributes and all the values. So in this case, I can see it's DN, Sys Chassis 1, Blade 3, some information about finite state machines that have run, who's the managing instance, how fast the memory is, what the model is, all that information's in the object that belongs to Compute Blades. This will also tell me how many objects came back. There were seven. And if I was programming with XML directly, I could click on the display XML of last query, and I could see the XML that was used to bring this data back. So that's the object model browser. Object model documentation, it used to be that you could only get the object model documentation if you downloaded the emulator. But DevNet, or at DevNet, we've put it up online. If you go to DevNet Technologies, go to Data Center, UCS Manager, Documentation, the object model is one of the things that you can select there. We have the UCS Manager object model. I have two versions that I put out there, version 4 and version 3. It's not the latest version 4, but it's, it's pretty recent. So there's the object model documentation. And if I go to something like, let's see, what's one to look at? Well, since I started with Compute Blade on the other one, I'll, I'll check out Compute Blade here as well. And this shows me what Compute Blade has available, what its SNMP OID is, the privileges, uh, how it's named. Blades are always named, and you saw in the DN, it's blade hyphen something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. And if I look at the property summary, it goes through every attribute, the type of attribute, where it's inherited from, whether it came from compute physical or some other object that inherited this information from. And let's see. We could give that compute blade a description. There aren't many things that you can set on a compute blade, but you can set a description. Now the description attribute, if I click on it, It'll bring me to the property detail. And here in that property detail is the regular expression that I can give to, I can use to give a description to a Compute Blade, zero to 256 characters. 
So that's the object model documentation. It's available on DevNet. Um, or if you download the emulator from communities.cisco.com, search for UCSPE, you'll get the object model documentation. All right, so Intersight. It works very similar. It communicates over HTTP. However, it's always secured. It is built on the OpenAPI standard. Currently, it's version two that it's built against, but version three object model or schema is coming out. Doesn't make a huge difference to you if you haven't started programming on it yet, but if you have, it's something to look out for because some changes have occurred in the object model. It also has a built-in API browser. You can download the specification and put it into an open API tool set <coughs> that'll create functions for you or, or generate code for you, things like that. Uh, we do have an API reference built into um, the browser. I'm going to show you that. And it's software as a service. So it's out in the cloud. There is an Intersight appliance, but the Intersight appliance is the same exact thing that you would get from the um, cloud-based Intersight, but typically it's a few um, weeks behind in getting its updates. So I think they push updates once a month for that. But for the most part, people are connecting to the cloud service. UCS Manager has a hierarchical model. It's just, you know, a root at the top, branches, nodes, branches, nodes, stuff like that. The Intersight object model could be that. It could be a tree, like that. It could be like this. It could be bipartite. Or it could be cyclic. It, the model, when you get back an object, will have links to other objects that it references in the model. And it's very possible that you could have a link that referenced another object, that referenced another object, that references back to that object you started with. So it's a little bit more complex, but it has the ability to provide better or more features, more capabilities. The documentation, I'll show you a demo of that. The, the browser, I'll show you that. So with Intersight, where is it? It's right here. When you log into Intersight, so I'm just logged into the dashboard here of a system that I have. If I click on help, Get more help on Cisco Intersight. Down at the bottom, you have the API documentation. So this is a pretty detailed document of how to use the API and make API calls. In fact, this query syntax, it's a very rich query language that OP, OpenAPI specifies. This query language lets you do sorting, grouping, aggregating, a whole bunch of different things. I recommend you know, going through it, trying the queries, see how, they, um, see how they work. I can almost guarantee you that there are questions on the certification exam on querying Intersight. I can guarantee you. Not almost, I can guarantee it. So learn how the query works. Basic queries, but learn how they work. You also have the API reference. Now the API reference is very similar to the object model documentation that we had in UCS Manager, but the API reference here is, I'm gonna say it's better. Because when I click on a resource like boot policy or boot slash precision policy, I see that I can do a get, a post, a get, a post, a patch, or a delete. So I can do a get on all the objects that are boot policies, I can, get a po I can do a post to create a boot policy. I can do a get on a specific boot policy's MOID, or its managed object ID. I can do a post and update a, man a uh, boot policy by providing the MOID. And I can also do a patch and update that same MOID. In a lot of cases, almost all the cases where you can do an update, you can do a patch or a post. Both will work. And then, of course, you can do a delete on a specific managed optic ID. So if I do a get, I have no boot policies. But we're going to create one. 
later on with some of the programming tools, and you'll see how that works with the, what body you sent through for a boot policy, um, or an NTP policy, or, or any one of the things that we have. Let's see if I have uh, something that produces some output. See, I'm searching along here, but what I really could have done is just went up here and typed org and found the thing that I was looking for. Go here, click org. So it brings back the objects in my system that are organizations. I have two organizations. I have one called Standalone, which is an organization of all my standalone equipment. And then I have an organization called Default, which is an organization of all my equipment. Here's the managed object ID that came back. Let's see if I can make that bigger. That's the managed object ID that came back. And if I want to run a post, or excuse me, a, a get on just that specific object, let me see if I grab the, I just gotta make sure I grab the right one. There it is. The top one's the one you want. So now I just got that managed object, that specific um, object that specified that organization. And you can see in this output, for something that is just a grouper, something that identifies a group of other things, we have a lot of information here. The links to the account that it belongs to, probably some other links down at the bottom to the type of object it is, a link to the permissions, a link to the resource group. Remember that cyclic graph or those bipartite graphs? These things will point to a number of different places. So that's the object browser as well as the um, API. If I look at just the organization or any of the objects, not at the operations, I can see the schema model. I can see the objects, attributes, and their types. So these are built-in tools to InterSight and UCS Manager to help you as a developer decide what, what you want to program or, or help you decide what, or know what's in the objects and how to utilize them. So the SDKs, what do we have? So right now we have a Python SDK for all the UCS manager uh, ones, Central, Manager, and IMC. We have an SDK in Python, and we have PowerShell libraries. So I'm going to talk about them for a minute. The way we make the Power Tool, or UCS Power Tool, and the Python SDK is it's generated from the schema. So we have a schema with all the objects, and we generate the commandlets, some 5,700 of them if you've been to one of my other sessions, or the Python modules that represent the classes for those objects. It's all generated except for about 2-3%, like the connection modules, the, um, some of the uh, utility modules, that, the modules that generate code for you. I'm going to show you how that works, but it's generated. So what can you do with something like UCS PowerShell? Oh, before I get there, I want to tell you a little bit about a change that's happened with UCS Power Tool. There's a change that's happening. This version, 2516, which is out on Cisco.com, is the last version that you'll be able to download from Cisco.com directly. It's also two revs behind now. So this is no more. It'll, it'll remain there, but it won't give you the latest version. The way to get the latest version or the newest version or to install it for the first time is to use the PowerShell command install hyphen module. If you've done any Python programming where you've done pip install library name or pip install module name, it's very similar to that. It reaches out to a repo. Now there's, there can be many repos that you can point to, but the default repo is one called PS Gallery. And it reaches out to that one and it pulls the module down. So we publish our modules now on PS Gallery for the Windows PowerShell system. That's what we publish on PS Gallery. You install the module, it pulls it down, and then when you want to use it, you import the module. If you want to talk to UCS or use UCS Manager command, let's import those commands. Central, IMC, or if you want to use desired state configuration commandlets that we have, it's not as popular as that I think Microsoft hoped it would have been, but if you want to, we have commandlets for that that help you generate code 
that you can then turn into a managed object format for uh, Microsoft DSC. So install it, and then import it, and then you can use it. That's from PS Gallery, and that's for Windows PowerShell. If you want PowerTool for Linux, like I run on my Mac, you have to go to community.cisco.com, search for UCS PowerTool Core, C-O-R-E, search for that, download the zip file, which is now at 2530, and follow the directions in the PDF on how to install it. On Mac, it's a simple unzip. On CentOS or some other Linux uh, variant, it might be different. But you get 2,470 Cisco UCS manager commandlets, a little over 800 for IMC, and almost 2,400 for UCS Central. Now this is a bit of a misnomer, just so you, you know how this works. This .core library or, or module that gets installed, it gets installed automatically when you install one of the other ones. But I just want to point it out. It's here in the Windows PowerShell one as well, this .core. It's not PowerTool Core. It's the name that the engineering team gave to the commandlets that are core to these three libraries. They didn't know that PowerShell was going to make PowerShell Core uh, later on. So it's kind of, it's been confusing, I know, for some people on the mailers and asking, you know, I've installed this .core, but it's not working. That's not what that means. That's the commandlets that are core to those other three, li three, <coughs> excuse me, three libraries. Same thing on Linux. It's the commandlets that are core to these other three libraries, not PowerTool Core. Although this is PowerTool Core on PowerShell Core on Linux. Just so you know what's there. And then to start it up on, on Linux, it's just you type in PWSH, you're in PowerShell, you can then run this file that's going to be in your home directory .local, share PowerShell modules. You could run it like that, or uh, I'm sorry, you could type PWSH and then run this file, or you could run this one command and that'll drop you into uh, PowerShell and start up uh, UCS PowerTool and load all the modules in. So once you have it, what do you do? You connect to UCS Manager, you query, you configure, and then you disconnect. That's what you do. So I got a couple examples. Let's see, which one is it? Let me find the right one. Looking in the wrong system. All right, so there it is. No, I take that back. I was in the right place. There we go. So very simply, if I want to connect to UCS Manager, I just say connect UCS dash name and then the IP address of the system I'm connecting to. Ask me for a username, ask me for a password. And it gives me back a connection object. My, what my cookie is, how I'm connected, SSL or no SSL. This is kind of a weird one. No SSL false means SSL. Who I am and what my rights are, my session, the UCS manager I'm connected to, the firmware version, its virtual IP address. I'm actually connecting through a, a NATed interface, so the virtual IP address is this private address that I have. But that's the connection object that I can do things like get, oh, get UCS blade, brings back all the blade objects. If I say get UCS blade and I want to see DNs, serials, and model, oh, sorry, it would help if I had the word in there. DN. So 
when I'm running Get UCS Blade or I'm running UCS Power Tool Commandlets, this pipeline is going to take the objects that come back and allow me to work with them on an object by object basis if I'd like to. Select object is a PowerShell commandlet that is aware of the type of object that's coming down the pipeline. So there, I typed in DN, and when I started to type serial, I just typed SE, and then I hit tab. And it knew, or it started at the first thing that it found that started with SE. And there's other ones, there's server ID, there's serial. So if I just kept hitting tab, it would cycle between those matches. It's aware of what's coming down the pipeline. So I know total memory, but I don't want to type it out, so I just type TO, I hit tab, and it pulled it out. So you get the objects, you can pass them down the pipeline, and you can manipulate them as they come down the pipeline. But you can do quite a bit. You saw before I entered a username and password. Now that's not the, the norm. You don't want to be doing that if you're automating because what would that be if you had to you put your username and password in? So you can create a PowerShell credential object, username, password, and that will create that object and then you can pass that to UCS Manager on that connect line. Connect to UCS MIP, pass the credential object, and you've connected. And then you go through your process of creating the things that you want to create. In this case, I want to create an organization. Then I want to add a service profile, add a boot policy. And what I'm doing here, I'm showing you two different ways to write the same thing. This first one uses Microsoft's line continuation character. It's a, a little back tick. It can get lost when you're, when you're looking at a lot of code. Sometimes you don't really see that. I know it's happened to me. The way I prefer to write the code is to wrap it in, curly, in, uh, in parens. And that way, I can continue across multiple lines without using the backtick character. And I've, I've found it, uh, it works better for me. But just, you know, if you prefer the backtick, that's fine. So I create my boot policy. I get my service profile, and then I want to add the boot policy to the service profile that I created. I'm passing the object that came back from Get UCS Service Profile down the pipeline to Set UCS Service Profile. Every command that brings an object back, and then you can take that object and you can pass it down the pipeline. So I pass it down the pipeline, Set UCS Service Profile expects a Service Profile object, so that's how it knows to set the boot policy name. In this one, I'm saying add the service profile to that UCS, or add, the, um, add a UCS service profile to the organization, call it Cisco Live SP, set the boot policy name, and modify present. So here's the thing. If I try to set a service profile and it doesn't exist, this would create an error because I'm trying to set something that doesn't exist. It wouldn't get that far because it would never get that object. But if I tried to set something that doesn't exist, I'd get an error. If I use add UCS service profile, even if it exists, if I put the flag modify present on the end, it will either create and set or update. And you won't get an error. So I prefer to use add UCS service profile or add any part of the, you know, the UCS system and use modify present. And so basically, I created an organization, I created a policy, I created a service profile, I, put, I also created a VLAN, and I put it out there um, into, into UCS Manager. Things that would probably take you a good 15, 20 minutes to click around in, but you can automate it with a script. Um, all this code, uh, or those eight example files, are out on GitHub under my user ID, moving a lot, M-O-V-I-N-A-L-O-T. Uh, this other code that I'm gonna show you is, uh, is also out there on GitHub. With Python, show you some Python code. Actually, you know what? I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna run this code real quick. I'm gonna remove the removes. So it actually runs. Oh. 
It worked. So it created the, organ it created the service profile UCS, um, our Cisco Live SP, Cisco Live Org, Cisco Live SP, created that. And then it also created a, a VLAN to go along with it. Cisco Live VLAN. Now, if I run this code again, it won't complain because these are just going to either update or overwrite what's already there. I'm going to actually have it removed this time. Once it's done, I'll, I'll kick it off again. So that's Power Tool. Use this Power Tool. It's PowerShell libraries. Python, on the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, is a little bit different. Now, with Python, I have to know what class I am creating, updating, and import that class into my Python module. I have to know what children classes and objects I'm creating underneath that BIOS profile, or service profile, or boot policy, whatever it may be, and bring them into my code. So if I want to create a BIOS profile that had the quiet boot in it, resume on AC power loss, or console redirection, I have to bring that into my code. And when I create those objects, after I've logged into UCS Manager, I create the, the parent object, and then I create the next object that's going to be a child of that parent, and I have to reference the parent that was just created, and I can create some other children, and then when I want to add that to UCS Manager, <coughs> excuse me, I have to call the addMO function that is part of the library, and pass that along. Again, I'm using modify present equals true. You'll see a lot of similarities between UCS Power Tool and the Python SDK. <clears throat> but until I call handle.commit or whatever you've called your connection handle, the content or the, the objects that you've created will just be local to your system, whether it's here or a VM using out in the cloud somewhere. So if I run this guy, Python add UCS BIOS boot policy, and I'll flip over here real quick. It'll pop up, it'll pop up right there where my arrow is. So that's the desk BIOS policy. So a bunch of code to create that policy. In PowerTool, it'll probably be about three commandlets just chained together. You could do it that way. Python, PowerShell, whatever you, whatever you prefer, up to you. And then if I want to remove that, I call the remove command which looks like this. <clears throat> Connect to UCS. Find the BIOS profile that I'm interested in. I could use a filter here just to get the specific one, or I could find the all the ones that match that class ID, loop through it until I find the one that I want to delete, add that object to the handle, say I want to remove it, and then it'll remove. So that's UCS Power Python SDK. You can do everything you can do in the UCS graphical interface, you can do with the Python SDK. Everything you can do with UCS Power Tool, or excuse me, <clears throat> in the graphical interface, you can do with the UCS Power Tool. It's complete coverage of, the, of those interfaces, or of those systems. The slides have numerous examples of filtering, configuration, transactions, how to compare and sync, how to get information from one UCS and sync it to another UCS. There's also code generation. I can run through the graphical interface, capturing the log of what I'm doing, and then take that log and convert it to code by running the convert to UCS commandlet, uh, commandlet on PowerTool or, oh, Oh, and I, I, I was going to say, or in Python, you can do the other way. I, I forgot that I didn't, I didn't have the slide right there. For Python, everything is managed out on GitHub. You download from GitHub and get the latest and greatest. You also get the latest and greatest defects if we have any. Or you do pip install, UCS MSDK, pip install, UCS CSDK, or pip install IMC SDK to get the three uh, SDKs for the, the three different system types that we have. 
Again, a bunch of examples that go through querying, connecting, filtering, uh, configuring, creating transactions, doing a compare and sync, a source UCS and a target UCS, grab some objects from one, see if those objects exist on the other. If they don't exist, put them there. But we also have this capability in both PowerTool and in Python to say delete not present, meaning if something's on the target UCS that isn't on the source UCS, delete it from the target. So you do have a true synchronization. So in Python, you would have to, whether you're on a Windows system or a Linux system, you load the convert to UCS Python uh, module and you access that function, pass it the XML log and it will generate the Python code for you so that you can um, do that same thing that you did just in the graphical interface, but in Python. Now what's neat about this is if you want to get involved in Python programming or power tool programming and you don't have the experience with the objects, go, do, go create the object or modify the object in the graphical interface, capture the code, and then generate code. It'll tell you the modules to load, it'll, tell you, it'll sh show you how to query the object and how to update the object. It's the easiest way to get going with that stuff. So I kind of demoed it along the way, and I want to talk a little bit about Intersight. So Intersight has a Python SDK, it has a Power Tool or PowerShell SDK. It will probably have a Go SDK in the future. Um, at the moment, the Python SDK and the PowerShell SDK that are available for download are generated from the OpenAPI spec. They're probably a few revs behind. So I don't know if you go into Intersight and it'll say, oh, new features available. These new features are here now. And then you go to get the Python SDK. I doubt that those new features will be in the Python SDK. It's a little bit behind. I would recommend that you just do pure REST API calls to the Intersight SDK. So with Intersight, we have to sign the requests. And signing the request is taking your, your key, your API key ID that's in Intersight, and the private key or the secret key that you got when you created your credential, and using that to sign your key. I have a repo out on GitHub called, it's moving a lot slash Intersight REST API, and it has an auth um, class that you can use to do that object signing. And when you do, when you use Python, if you're familiar with the Python requests module to do HTTP requests, you can specify a alternative author authorization mechanism. The file that I have out there for doing auth will work with that request file. Yep. And then you just process the REST API call like you would any other REST API call. You reach out to the resource that you want to get, and it'll pull that back. Or you send along body of a resource you want to update or create, and it'll update or create that body. So I, sh I can show you that Python stuff, but what I really want to get to is this Ansible. I know I only have like a half a minute left, or maybe I don't. Let's see if we can do here. We have a new thing coming in Ansible for UCS and, in, and Intersight. The new thing is this, it's uh, Ansible Collections. Has anybody heard of Ansible Collections? It's this new paradigm that Ansible is going to. So it is right now, the methodology is when you download Ansible, you get all the modules from all the vendors who put modules into Ansible. In future versions of Ansible, I think starting with version three or the version three line, those vendor modules are going to be removed from Ansible and the way to get them is to do an Ansible Galaxy collection install vendor and then the, the, the collection that you want. So the namespace for UCS would be cisco.ucs, for intersight it would be cisco.intersight. And you get those modules and you call them in your playbook just like you do now, except you prepend to, if you say you're using UCS underscore VLANs module for, inter, for um, UCS manager Ansible, just prepend the the class, the vendor and uh, dot um, module name to that and you'll be able to use the collection. So it's a very minimal change in your playbook but a big change for Ansible. 
So I'll just do a quick Ansible demo and then uh, we'll wrap it up. So in Ansible, we don't have as many modules as we did for UCS PowerTool. UCS PowerTool, you saw we had like 5,700 commandlets and, and a multitude of libraries or modules for the Python SDK. We really couldn't do that for Ansible because we would just, we would never be able to get them all merged in. Now we might do it for the collection, but for merging it into Ansible, we couldn't do that. So we created a module called UCS Managed Objects. And UCS Managed Objects takes either YAML or JSON specification of the object you want to create, update, or delete. And it allows you to go ahead and create that. So for this, um, these two BIOS profiles that I want to create, I just went ahead and specified in the YAML the same hierarchical structure that I would have specified with PowerTool or with Python, and I put the properties in, referencing the classes, quiet boot, AC on power loss, or console redirection, and that'll go through, run the playbook, and create those BIOS policies just like it did before with the Python one right there. It's a very straightforward process, but if you're using Python SDK, you'll be able to use the Ansible uh, for UCS very easily. Similarly, with Intersight, if you use Ansible, find the right one here. That's not it. It's a very similar process. You specify the hierarchy. You could do it in JSON or you could do it in YAML specify what you're creating, the properties and their attributes, and you just run that through your playbook and it gets updated in Intersight. Lastly, what I have out on the, um, in that Intersight REST API uh, library or repo, I have a Postman collection. So if PowerShell, Python, Ansible are still not where you're at with your programmability, download the repo, import the collection and the environment, set up your API key and your secret key in the environment, and you'll be able to make REST API calls to Intersight. You set up your environment, you put your API key ID in, your secret key in, and you'll be able to make these REST API calls. And all you have to do to know what the REST API call is, is do it in the browser, capture that network output in the browser, look at the payload, and if you want to do something like create an NTP policy, use Postman, create the body, and you'll pass that up to Postman, or pass that up to Intersight and it'll create that NTP policy. I'm doing an Intersight workshop, works, uh, workshops two at 6 p.m. tonight, if you want to run through this, uh, it, you know, physically run through it. So that collection is available for download as well. And the slides show you how to set up your environment. There's a lot of slides. Um, if you have any questions, just come find me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff uh, more than you probably want to hear about it. You can follow me on Twitter. I'll tweet repos that I update or the new ones that I put out. Uh, and my GitHub repo is slash moving a lot. All this stuff is there. Please fill out the surveys. Continue your education. Thanks for coming.